But if you'll turn your, your Bibles to Jude 20, I mean Jude, there is no 20, Jude is just the book of Jude. If you'll turn your Bibles over to Jude, what I wanted to say is we're going to be covering all 25 verses. You know, one of the things, I was just talking to a pastor about how, you know, it's my desire one day to eventually, you know, be in the ministry more full-time or work less, uh, less of a full-time job and just be more of the ministry. One of the things that, that uh, is one of my goals is eventually be able to preach the entire Bible, you know, Genesis all the way to Revelation. And you would probably end up doing that something like on a Wednesday night or maybe even a Sunday night because, you know, Sunday morning is usually when you're, you want to preach some of the, the more, uh, the tougher topics or, you know, just things that the Lord has laid on you. And uh, I was like, well, how do I start a series of Wednesday night if I don't preach every Wednesday night? So I thought it was easy. Jude, we'll be able to cover the entire book of Jude. And there we go. We've got one covered. Now we only have 65 to go. But, um, you know, and, it, it, uh, and I appreciate the pastor always letting me get up here uh, and preach. You know, I know I don't get to do it often uh, on a Wednesday or Sunday, but, you know, it's always a privilege and an honor to do so. Do so. And you know, I take that, that real seriously. So if you guys will just turn to the book of Jude, and we're actually going to go through all 25 verses. We're just going to uh, break it down, and uh, we're going to break it down by five verses and just, you know, just get the word, just make it a true biblical study. So we'll, we'll read through those first five verses right there. And uh, if you'll just look there in Jude 1, we're going to go down to verse 5. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And there's a couple of things here that we're going to take a look at. You know, we're just, this is a rope. It's not going to be anything, you know, I'm not going to go into deep theology. I, as a matter of fact, I've not gone to Bible school. You know, I've learned everything straight from directly from the Bible and from Pastor Cobb. He's the one that's guided and trained me and brought me up in the fear and admonition of the Lord when it comes to, you know, preaching. And there's a couple of things that stand out there. There in Jude 1, it says that, you know, we've been sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. And I like that uh, term there because there's a big battle right now, uh, you know, and the more we go soul winning on, on uh, the weekends or... Uh, during the week, it doesn't matter what time of the day we go, uh, one of the things that we run into is this challenge that people can be saved but lose their salvation. As a matter of fact, it, you know, sometimes it's kind of ambiguous, that fight. Other times it's more direct. I mean, this weekend we had a guy who basically said, you know, you have to constantly be working on the salvation because if you don't repent of your sins or if you don't ask God for forgiveness and you die in that sin, you're going to hell. Well, the Bible is very clear. If, he, if we're preserved in Jesus Christ, it's forever. And if you'll turn there, this, this is the only time we're going to turn out of, uh, well, actually, we're going to be in Psalm and in 2 Peter just once. Um, but if you'll turn there to uh, Psalm 37, verse 10, I, you know, I want to go. And then the other argument we hear is that because uh, salvation was through Jesus Christ and he came in the New Testament, you know, there was no Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Salvation was different, but that's not the, the case. As a matter of fact, we see salvation throughout the entire Bible. Now, we're going to focus on the, the book of Jude, but if you go there to Psalm 37, verse 10, and, uh, you know, talking about preservation, the Bible, actually, God's talking to us, and He says, For yet a little while, and the wicked one shall not be, yea, though, yea, though shall diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast, up poor, to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of, 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 as be of upright conversation. Their sword 
shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and the inheritance shall be forever. And that's the point I want to, well, I'm, we're going to go down to 27, but the very first thing you see this is God's laughing at the calamity of the wicked. And the reason I chose this set of verses is because we're going to see later on how God's warning us in the book of Jude about certain people that are like this. And what's interesting is people say, well, God wouldn't do that. Well, God says here that he's actively laughing at the wicked and he knows what their demise is. Now, he doesn't want anybody to perish, but I believe this is talking about those who've already rejected Christ ultimately, right? And it says, verse 19, uh, but the, uh, verse 18 says, the Lord knoweth the things of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. So how long is their inheritance? Forever. So then it makes sense if we go back to Jude 1, 1, that he preserved us in Jesus Christ. So when did God preserve us in Jesus Christ? Forever. Because we know that our inheritance has been forever. This is the Old Testament before Jesus walked on the earth. But God is infinite and is outside of time. Let's go to verse 19. It says, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as fat lambs. They shall consume, into the smoke shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed in, of him shall inherit the earth, and they shall be cursed of him shall be, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and this seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore, for the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. So we see there again in verse 28 that he's preserving the saints forever. And we see there in verse uh, 1 of Jude 1 that Jesus Christ has preserved us, but the wicked shall be cut off. And when we see that word cut off, it's also just meaning that you know they're basically reprobate. They've been cast out and you know they know their demise and so let's keep reading there go back to Jude uh, and then the only other time we're going to switch is second uh, Peter in case you want to second Peter 2 chapter 2 and I was gonna I mean for the sake of time I didn't but a, a good study of Jude would be to also just follow you know second Peter 2 verse 2 I mean chapter 2 not verse 2 because you know it's basically almost a repetition of what we see in second Peter but you know I encourage you to do that study in your own we're just going to touch on it a little bit. But uh, if you go there to verses, uh, uh, verse 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. So another thing that we see is that Jesus has preserved us throughout all time because it's a common salvation. It's something that is not unique to one specific group of people. And one of the things that you're going to notice about false religions is that they make this uh, thing of salvation something unique to a set of rules that they've implemented that only they understand. And usually it's very uh, you know, secretive, it's very ambiguous, it's based on works, and if you ask people what, what the works are, they can never answer. You know, uh, coming from a Seventh-day Adventist background, people would talk about the Sabbath like it was you know, the way to salvation. Well, what if you miss one Sabbath? A and they could never give you an answer, because of course, there's no, there's no such thing. I mean, people miss you know, church for being sick. People miss churches because they don't want to show up. So what if you didn't show up several Sabbaths? Does that mean you're not going to heaven? I mean, the Bible tells us of a common salvation, which is the preservation in who? In Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John 14, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I know we use that verse a lot, but it's a very important verse because it's very clear the plan of salvation that Jesus has for us to get into heaven. You know, we're going to keep reading there. It says, it was needful for me to write unto you, so he needed to write to them and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. And here's another thing that's real important is that he's telling us or Jude is telling us that uh, through the inspiration of God that we need to contend. Another word for contend or contentious is to fight. In other words, we need to be out there boldly speaking for the faith of Jesus Christ. What we, you know, it's not just a matter of we don't like soul winning just because it looks good. We like soul winning because it's a commandment of Christ. You know, the Bible says contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And if we go back to Psalm 37, he's talking about the saints. You know, he's going to preserve the saints. 
And he forsaketh not his saints, it says in verse 28, you don't have to go there, in Psalm 37 it says, For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints, they are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. So it says, Exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith which, with the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And then we look at verse 4, it says, For there were certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And so then another thing we see here is that there's certain men, meaning for me, what it, what the way that I read it is that if you're going to a good Bible-believing church, even a church of this size, I know we're a little bit smaller than most other churches, it doesn't matter, it says there's certain men crept in unawares. So we have to be careful and we have to be actually diligent and aware that even in a church this size, there's certain men that have crept in unawares. And in the last couple of years, you know, since I've been coming to this church, since I've been under the tutelage and leadership of Pastor Cobb, we've, we've run into certain men that have crept in unawares, and, and we're probably, we'll probably run into them in the future again. And so we have to be aware. That's why we contend for the faith. That's why we have to preach the truth. Number one, it's a commandment, but number two, it's because that's the only way to weed out all these false prophets that are coming into the church. And it says there, uh, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness or, you know, not being able to control your desires and your lusts. And, you know, we can speak of lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes, but just anything that isn't of God. It says they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, they've used the excuse that God's given them grace to do things that are not correct. And so that's how we know that these uh, men have crept in unaware and that they're doing ungodly things. The Bible says ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that if they deny God, then they hate God. And the Bible tells us that if they hate God, then we should hate them. So it's not just a matter, that's why we contend. Because when you contend, right, if, you, if you're fighting for something that you uh, love, that means usually you're fighting something that you hate that's coming against the things that you love, right? And so we have to contend earnestly for that faith. Now let's go to verses 6 through 10. You know, this sets up kind of where we're headed with this. So God, you know, Jude is giving a warning and he's giving encouragement for the things that we need to be aware of. So he's giving us that encouragement by saying, look, Jesus has preserved you. You're going to contend for the faith if you do these things. But now you've got to be careful because there's certain things going on in your congregation, in your life, in your faith, in your ministry that are going to be happening. And these are the individuals you need to be looking out for. Let's go to verse 6 of Jude. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked ex rebuke thee. Sorry, I, don't, I, I got tongue-tied there. But the, the one thing that we see here, well, there's a couple of things we see here. Number one, it says that... Uh, it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. So, you know, we always talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, but we, what we don't always point out is that there were cities around that were just as bad or almost as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. See, this wasn't a problem that was just specific to one area. This was rampant. It was all around. I mean, why did God destroy the world through a flood? Because it was rampant. What is it that we're seeing nowadays? It, that is this, uh, this wickedness, this amorality or immorality as you people want to call it whatever you want to put uh, whatever label you want to put it I, I'll give you the label anti-god ungodly antichrist is rampant you know I mean look at we're in a Wednesday night service and I have no problem saying that you know there's four or five of us here why is that in the city of Houston and you know you're talking about in this area because a couple of things are going on in the Spring Branch area right and the Bible says that you know we should go to the poor first you know, this area wasn't as affluent 
or as uh, middle class or upper middle class as it used to be. Now it's becoming that. And it's nothing, I'm not saying that the rich or the, the fluent can't get saved. I'm just saying they have a harder time getting saved and following Christ because they have some of the comforts of life that they're not willing to give up. You know, they're about to put some three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar homes just right in front of the church here, probably three or four hundred of them. And, you know, I want to see how many of those are willing to come to this church. You know, when you're telling them that maybe they shouldn't be doing some of the things that they're, they're doing to get some of the wealth that they're getting, uh, they might walk in and listen to us for about five minutes and then walk out and never listen to us again. I mean, we got we have that happen all the time. And the other thing that we have to that we're, we're seeing here is what is it that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner? What were they giving themselves over to? You know, they're giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. And you know what's interesting is when we think of this, maybe a few years back when we're thinking of strange flesh, we know of one thing for sure, right? We're talking about uh, sodomy, homosexuals, you know, those that are going men after men or women after women. But nowadays, this brings more true, especially, I mean, even after today, uh, you know, Pastor, we were just talking about how in the news today, the city of Houston voted, which is the only, probably about the only good thing the city of Houston has done in the last couple of years, but they voted against uh, opening a business for sex robots, you know, but the Bible says after strange flesh, well, if you've studied anything about th this company in Canada that makes these robots, they're made to feel like human flesh, but it's a strange flesh. It's not human flesh, right? It says, and what are they using it for? For fornication. I mean, basically, it's fornication of the mind. The Bible says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, right? The corruption of the mind. It says, suffering the vent, and what are they going, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. See, that should be an example to these individuals that they're going to suffer the same, you know, uh, judgment that they're going to suffer in all eternity, but instead they're more worried about the mighty dollar. You know, what ended up happening is they said, no, you can't do it in Houston. And this owner uh, said that he's just going to go to the unincorporated areas and try to open the business there. So this is not going away anytime soon. And this is a problem. It's a problem because it's a, an attack on marriage. It's an attack on the family. It's an attack on morality. It's just an attack on everything. Because think about it. What, what do you have to gain from putting an emotional, uh, physical act that God gave us to be in the marriage bed to uh, an android or a robot or something like that. I mean, it goes beyond anything we could ever imagine. I mean, so this strange flesh, think about how, how appropriate. It's amazing that God didn't put homosexuals just there because it's strange flesh is going to cover a lot of things like bestiality, like all these weird imaginations that they're getting. And now, robots. We might as well just include, we might as well add that, and who knows what else we're going to be able to add to that list, right? It says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. See, whenever we have something like that, it's a defilement of the flesh. It says, despise dominion and speak evil of dignity. See, they don't, they don't even care that a government told them not to. They're going to do it anyways, is what basically the, the response was. It says, but what did, what did, uh, what did verse 9 says? Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but, the, but said, the Lord rebuke these. And then another thing we see here is that we shouldn't get so puffed up that we think that we can attack or deal with powers that are beyond us and, and, and call them out. You know, I, I did it when I was younger and I wasn't saved and I thought I knew better. And I would go around challenging. I'd let people know that I, I wasn't afraid of the devil and I challenged the devil. Well, I mean, according to the Bible, I was doing that's wrong because the first thing is we don't understand the power that the devil has. We don't understand the things that he can or cannot do. So it's not for us to do that. It's for us to leave it to the Lord to rebuke it. I mean, if Michael, the archangel, wouldn't do it, we shouldn't go around doing it. And that is a big challenge because if you get so puffed up that you think you're so spiritual that you can deal with the supernatural, then you're no longer in the will of the Lord, right? God gave us a specific duty, and, he, and actually Jude will go through that. He's setting all this up, so we should not test powers we don't understand. And if we're willing to test the power that, that is bigger than us, even if it's for what we think good, what may, what's to stop us from then, uh, you know, challenging God himself? Which is what's happening now with society. You know, uh, people just think that God didn't create the world in six days and that the Bible, you know, was written by man and not by God and that certain things haven't carried over and, uh, you know, that it's not salvation by grace only and that Jesus, you know, died 
but you know maybe God didn't turn his back on him and then we don't need the blood of Christ we just need Jesus. I mean these are the things that you're hearing and I'm just covering a little bit but these are the those that crept in unawares because we're not following the biblical standards of God's given I mean Jude's a tiny book 25 verses in, in in respect to the rest of the Bible but there's a lot of doctrine in it so you know it's not just that I wanted to get through one of the books but I actually enjoy reading Jude quite a bit because every time you read it you just get something new out of it let's go to verses 11 through 15 it says woe unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of court these are the spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about winds trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots raging waves of sea foaming out of their uh, own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him and so we see a couple of things here you know God's warning us to be careful he says go to the Old Testament go to your entire Bible and read and don't go of the way of Cain well, what was Cain's problem Cain wanted God to recognize him for him not the other way around right Abel brought a sacrifice a blood sacrifice which is a foreshadowing of Jesus dying on the cross for us Cain was like look I'm a I'm a hippie I'm gonna bring you some fruits and you know I need you to now bless this and that's what we do many times right we get into the ministry or we do certain things and we're doing it for our cause not for God's for God's sake you know and this says ran greedily after the heir of Balaam what was Balaam's challenge well first of all I mean he got in a fight with a dumbass you know and I mean if the why are you gonna get in a fight with an animal that's bigger than you and then when the angel showed up then he was apologetic but then we read later that he led people astray for money basically that's what he did right he kept he would play both sides of the coin it depended on who was giving him the right amount of money and we're not going to go into that story I mean we, we should do a whole sermon on that and then it says in Paris in the gang saying of Korah and we know the sons of Korah you know what did they do they murmured and spoke against uh, Aaron and Moses and the earth swallowed them up I mean that's one of the most clear signs of hell that we have in the Old Testament the earth just swallowed them up whole well where's hell in the center of the earth so basically God has said I'm not even gonna take your spirit I'm just taking you all this is what you get for murmuring against my people and one of the things it tells us also is that we should re respect those that God has anointed to lead uh, a congregation it says there in a in a verse 12 it says without fruit twice dead plugged up by the roots and I don't you know one of the things that we go out when we go soul waiting is we're always telling people of the second death and so this is very clear uh, indication of God's commandment that you know if we reject them or we're not saved through Jesus Christ we're gonna suffer the second death which is being cast into the lake of fire it says those who are not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire and this is the second death and uh, and uh, and so they're plucked up by the roots we know there's a lot of references to roots but one of the ones that I can think of is you know the love of money is the root of all evil so I mean if they're plucked up by the roots and they're twice dead uh, one of the easiest examples is they're doing this for filthy lucre's sake and we're gonna see this later where they're making merchandise of them and they're using swelling words we're not gonna get ahead of ourselves here but you know another thing that we just see is that uh, there that God's gonna have the Saints ten thousands of Saints they're gonna come to judge right so uh, there's another it's a small group you guys probably don't know of them but there's a small group of preachers up in the Northeast and they've done a series of and they're not even I'm, they're false preachers and they've done a series of videos about uh, you know how not everybody that's saved is a saint obviously they haven't read their Bible uh, through and through or, and if they are they're taking it out of context because the Bible is speaking specifically to those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ now let's move on to the 16 to th through 20 and let's just uh, get here for the sake of time let's go ahead and start wrapping this up but it says there in verse 16 it says now he gave us these examples right Cain Balaam and Kor and Kor you know we know that one of the things that one of his major sins was that he murmured or spoke against 
Moses and Aaron, right? And then the verse 16 says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. See, the challenge is not where we're walking. It's that we're walking for Christ. We're letting Christ lead our, our path. Or we're walking after the things that we want to gain, right? It says, And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. You know, what's interesting is, we were just, Pastor and I were visiting shortly before, and I was telling him about how next week I'm going to be in Atlanta for a, a conference of a group of preachers that, you know, Pastor knows that I listen to and that I've met through different conferences. And one of the things that they're going to be preaching on is, you know, this false religion of Judaism, uh, that how they try to tie it to the biblical Jews, right? And, you know, and uh, Israel and all of that. Long story short, I'm not going to get into all that, but long story short, they're preaching the truth about the Bible. And uh, I registered through their event. They set it up through this thing called Eventbrite. And uh, as shortly before we started the sermon, Eventbrite returned my money for this event and took basically re took all the, the money that they were doing for this event. It was only $33, but it's just like a holding place for the event. They returned it, I said, because it, got, it violated their guidelines. And what it is is they don't like that men of God are preaching the word of God. And so they're actually going after their money. You know, the Bible tells us in Revelation that those who take the mark of the beast will not be able to buy or sell. You know, we're getting to the point where technology is controlling the narrative where if you speak against the world, if you speak against the things that are true, you know, if you speak against sin, if you speak the Bible, if you say God is the way through Jesus Christ, the only way, the Father, you know, all these things... They're going to take your money and return it, and they're going to stop you from being able to transact the things that you need to transact. I mean, it's getting that bad. This is a serious attack on the men of, and women of God, but it says, because they're not, we're not speaking swelling words, we're speaking truth. Now, some people might get excited about what we preach, but those are far and few between. But right here it says, their murmurs complain, walking after loneliness, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's purpose persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having not, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So God's telling us, look, you need to stay focused because there's going to be guys that are coming that aren't focused. And they're going to be saying things that sound sweet but aren't. They're bitter to the stomach, right? And they're going to be doing things that just don't make any sense. They're going to be mocking the Word of God. You know, anytime that you get a, a translation that removes deity and removes doctrine and removes virgin birth and Jesus Christ is the only way, you don't have to be outwardly laughing that's a mockery you know that's a mockery of the word of god that's a blasphemy and a watering down of the word of god we we need to not be walking with those individuals it says who walk after their own ungodly lusts and a pastor was giving me he says he's gotten a couple of these and we were just talking and then he went and he actually got this out of the trash because we were talking about this cancellation and he said look you should see this they spent a lot of money i mean this is actually a really nice uh pamphlet uh, you know, I we print stuff up all the time. This is probably, you know, several dollars. And if you send this out in the thousands, you're probably talking five, ten grand, maybe even, maybe even higher. This is a conference by uh, it's uh, called Orange Conference, and it's by uh, he. I think you, you said it was John Maxwell. But I said first of all, one of the things I want to look at is how many Bible verses are in here because you know it's meant for ministry. There's no Bible verses in here, and, and it's all about self help. You know, it's all about this programming, and, you know, they're charging you uh, 200, uh, how much are they charging? Pay only $259 per person for one day only. So, I mean, you do the math. $259 is not an easy amount of money to, for most people. That's a lot of money to go to a conference for one day to just get motivated. You know what? I can just read my Bible and get enough motivation. That's, that's not going to cost me a thing. But the more dangerous thing is right here it says... For they, were, they speak great swelling words of vanity. This is what this is. This is a swelling words of vanity because what I've been to these things. Before I got saved, I was into the self-help movement like you wouldn't believe. And you're going to go to these things and you're going to get 
uh, fired up because they're going to tell you you can do anything and if you believe it, you can achieve it. But it's all uh, vain and fruitless because when you leave, you still have to face reality. You still have to face the world. When God tells you is, is the best, right? Because he tells you, look, the more you believe on me, the harder it's going to get. But you have a reward waiting for you there at the end. And uh, if you guys go there, go to Second Peter 2. I just want to correlate some of this with uh, Jude uh, 16 through 20, and then we're, we're going to close out here with uh, 21 through 25. But just Second Peter 2, verse 17, and then we're going to be back in Jude, and we'll close out. Uh, it says, it's basically almost the same words there. It says, uh, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. So God's telling you, look, all this vain stuff is only leading to everlasting darkness. It says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servant of cor servants of corruption. For of who a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteous than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So this is telling you that these individuals came in, they crept in unawares, and they look the part sometimes, and they smell the part. But look, it had been better for them not to show up because it's going to be worse for them. And they're going to use this opportunity to try to draw some of us out. But the Bible says that you know those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. So eventually, we will find out who's trying to lead us astray, is what the Bible's telling. He's going to protect us. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get uh, maybe scammed or taken for a ride in the process. It just means that ultimately, in the end, God's going to take care of us. We're not going to fall into that trap. You know, it might sound good at first. Somebody might come in and they might look like, like, like the part. They might be on fire for the Lord. But down the road somewhere, God will reveal it to us. And he'll take care of us so we're not falling into that same trap. And, you know, we were just talking about that earlier, Pastor and I, about somebody who came in a couple months ago and they, they sounded good and they, they played the part and they did all that. And then they just kind of, they were it was revealed, their true nature and their true heart. And so God just took care of that because, honestly, you know, you get so caught up and, and, and you hear certain key words, right? Jesus Christ and salvation and so many. Sometimes you're like, man, that... That's it. That's the guy that's gonna, we're going to run with. And guy has another plan because he's, why, he's protecting us from these individuals who have great swelling words. Let's go to verse 20, 21 through 25 of Jude, and then we'll close out with just three things that we can take away from this chapter. But uh, Jude uh, 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. See, we have eternal life. But God wants us. To, we're looking forward to that already it says and some of us have compassion making a difference see the only way you make a difference is by the compassion it says and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garments spotted by the flesh now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever. So the Bible is telling us, look, you, your, your whole goal is to be a soul winner. You know, and I, and I want to make something clear because I know we have a soul winning program. When I mean soul winning, God wants us to preach the word. You know, we do soul winning every week now where we go out in twos if we, if we have them and we knock doors for an hour, two hours, maybe three or four hours during the week, six or eight, whatever it takes, right? But that's not the commandment. That's one of the ways that God sent soul winners. But the other ways that he sent soul winners was, you know, when you run into someone in the street. I mean, Jesus, you know, the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman, that he, he went knocking on her door. He just happened to be at the same well. And then he led her to Christ himself. I mean, we're not going to do that, right? We're going to lead him to Christ. But what I mean by the soul winner is we, our purpose is to lead others to Christ. 
whether it's our friends and family, whether it's through the ministry, whether it's just because of consistent prayer, the whole goal of us, of, of our living after we've been saved is, is to grow in the word so that we can lead better lives. But more importantly than that, because we're sinners, we're still going to mess up, is to lead others to Christ. You know, at the end of the day, no matter how long our lives are, nothing, uh, we, we take nothing with us. It means nothing. But right here, he's telling us, look, and some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In other words, he's saying, look, you've got to hate sin so much that you're willing to do whatever it takes to lead others to the same end that you have, which is eternity with Christ. I mean, you should, it, it, it should stir up so much compassion that all we want to do with our lives is lead others to Christ. And I understand that we have to lead lives also, right? We have kids, we have wives, we have jobs, we have to put food on the table. There's things that we have to do. Pastor was telling me about how he had to change out a battery for his car and it took several hours. You know, obviously, if you're doing that, you're not having the opportunity to sow in, but in the process, God had a bigger plan and he was able to fellowship with another pastor. But at the end of the day, when you do all those things, we should get back to doing the main thing. See, the, most of the time, though, people go to church, they clock in, and then they leave, and they clock out. And then they go back to their lives, and that's the, that's the extent of their spirituality. Because they, they're looking for what? The swelling words. But for us, we're looking for much more than that. And it's not even for the reward, because the Bible tells us that when we get the crowns, we're just going to lay them back at the Father's feet. I mean, in God's, uh, we're going to kneel down and lay them down at His feet. We're going to be so in awe that is power and majesty, that it's not even for that. So might as well remove that from your ego as well. You're, you're doing it because Christ commanded you to do it. And the, the bottom line is that these are the things that we need to be careful with. And so Jude's giving us a kind of a warning. He encourages you at first. Then he's giving you this warning about all these false preachers. And so th what's the three things that we can take away from this chapter? Well, God is consistent and persistent in his desire for us to fight for the faith. I mean, he's telling us, look, be earnest and contend for the faith. You've got to be ready. And the Bible tells us to study, to show ourselves approved, right? Be instant in season and out of season. Preach the word. God is also consistent in his warning of false prophets. I mean, we, we see that correlation in uh, Second Peter. You know, you can see it in Revelation. You can see it in Timothy. Those are clear, right? But we also see it in Isaiah. And we see it in Jeremiah. And we basically see it in all the Old Testament. That there's all these false prophets. And there's these things that are going to come about that we have to be careful with. And you see it now. I mean, today we got that st stupid text. Not everybody. Apparently not everybody got the text. My wife didn't. But we got the text uh, about the emergency uh, FEMA system, right? That if there's something wrong, they can text us. I see it as a bigger sign. You know, the Bible says that the whole world will worship the beast. The entire world will know of this individual. Well, with this kind of technology, you can get the message across pretty quick. Think about the ability to just get into anybody's phone and tell them what you think they need to think. I mean, we're getting to this day and age where the narrative is con constantly being controlled, and we have to learn to think for ourselves, but the way we do that is through God's Word. You know, most people will just fall for anything. They'll, they'll read something like this and get excited because they're not in their word. They'll spend $259 for that, but they won't spend two hours and 59 minutes reading the word of God. You know, I'd rather do that than spend $259. And then the final thing is just God wants us to be soul, wiener, uh, soul winners and, uh, so we, and not seek the affection of men, right? And so God's saying, look... In the, in the book of Jude, 25 verses, so much to cover. I mean, you could preach other sermons out of this. Just There's so much that you could do. But God says, look, at the end, pull people out of the fire and don't look after those people with great swelling words. I mean, we have good examples of individuals in this town that speak great swelling words. I mean, I can think of one right now that runs a pretty big church. His name is Joel Olstein. And I can think of another one that runs several campuses by, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm just going to say, Ed Yates, you know, uh, or what is it? Uh, Ed Young, sorry, I know an Ed Yates. Sorry, I get emails from an Ed. Ed Young, it seems like the more you go to that church, you know, I used to go when I was first saved, and I wasn't, you know, I was looking around and seeing if I, I if, you know, this contemporary movement calls sometimes, and if you're not in the Word, you just go, I, I didn't want to skip church, so I would go to that church when I was first, first saved, like 25, 26 
and I was going to work. And I never liked it because it was just real relaxed. And, and for the most part, you know, Ed Young doesn't really preach there anymore. He preaches like one sermon a quarter. He does a series. But you get all these other guys, and they speak whatever you want them to speak. And it's, they got the nice videos, and they got the nice games, and they do the carnivals, and they do all the, the video editing and all that. It's just great. Swell, I mean, all I can think of is great swelling words of vanity. They say all the right things to keep as many people in the pews as possible, to keep as much money in their pockets as possible. Because if you're saying the truth, you're not going to be that big. That's just the bottom line, the Bible says it. So bottom line is just God is consistent and persistent in his desire for us to fight for the faith. He also wants to warn us about false prophets, and we need to be aware of them. They creep unawares, and then God wants us to be soul winners and forget about what other people think and not be respecter of persons, but just go out there and preach the truth. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, preach uh, either a Wednesday evening or a Sunday morning, Lord. And, but more importantly, I thank you that we have a, uh, a great pastor and a great leader that we can learn from. And I appreciate Pastor Cobb giving me this opportunity. Lord, just be with us as we go about our week. Be with all those that are here. Uh, just watch over their health. Watch over uh, their families. And Lord, just uh, stir them up so that they can, uh, and including myself, so that we can continue to preach the word and lead others to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.